I love sharks so much it hurts. I'll risk underwater explosions. Wow, I felt that. Ultra close shaves and even feeding frenzies to get close to them. Join me, Ian Gordon, as I put my life on the line in the name of shark research. <laughs> I got knocked over. <laughs> G'day, I'm Ian Gordon. As a shark researcher, I've spent the last 20 years of my life working with the world's most dangerous animals, and every encounter's a real adrenaline rush. As experienced as I am, I've learnt there's a surprise around every corner. And believe me, I've had a few. Luckily, I'm still around to talk about them. So sit tight, and I'll tell you about some of my closest calls. My all-time favourite shark is the Great White. It's got eight rows of razor-sharp serrated teeth and jaws that can cut a man in half with one bite. In this first story, I'm off the Neptune Islands on the south coast of Australia, where there have recently been two fatal attacks attributed to the Great White. While everybody knows the Great White's bad boy reputation, we know very little else about them. So for more than 10 years, I've been tagging these sharks, trying to learn more. Here he comes. Whoa! <laughs> She's probably about 2,200 to 2,300 pounds. It's a very big shark. And he's coming back around again. Here he goes. Come on, mate. Where's that number? Oh, yes. Great whites are the perfect predator. They've existed since long before T Rex but we probably know more about dinosaurs than we do about great white sharks. Attaching tags allows us to identify them and track where they go. But tagging them can have its moments. Coming straight at my bait. Straight at my bait. Here comes Ian, here comes Ian. And it doesn't come much closer. <laughs> have a look at that in slow here motion. Ian, here comes Ian. <laughs> Those sharks come in so fast sometimes you really got to watch your feet, I'll tell you. <laughs> the jaws of the Great White have a deadly reputation, but it takes a high-speed camera to show how beautifully designed they are. When a white shark attacks, it comes in a rush fast enough to push its one-ton body halfway out of the water. And it doesn't simply open its mouth and bite. At the moment of strike, the jaws actually extend forward for maximum chomp. And what a chomp. The Great White's bite pressure is believed to exceed 4,000 pounds per square inch. And that's why we call them the ultimate predator. Over 120 million years of evolution has created those jaws. The lower jaws act as a holding tool to be able to hold the prey, whereas the upper jaw throws out from the gums and acts as a cutting tool. And inside those jaws, the implement of destruction are these teeth. Big triangular teeth. These are upper jaw teeth, these ones. Lots of serrations down the sides, whereas the lower jaw tooth is a little bit narrower. Still cuts, but it's used mostly as a holding tool. One of the other really amazing things about these animals is that they shed teeth regularly. So if this shark loses this tooth just here, in about five to seven days, it's got a brand new one. Absolutely unbelievable. So when my research takes me into the water with them, it pays to have good protection from the cold as well as the sharks. Time to have a bit of fun, haha. <laughs> This is D8 hanging around right now. She coming up, have a bit of a look. Hello D8, how are you going? Good old D8, she's a big shark, she's about 18 feet long and she's coming back again. Coming up, have another look. Whoa, look at that. She can 
save the bait over this side. She's going to have another go. Whoa! Now that's a rush. A big shark like that comes up to the cage, moves it all over the place, bouncing the cage backwards and forwards. These animals are the ultimate predator. Some people would be worried about being in the water, these sharks. But these animals are my life, and I love them. The more time I can spend in the water of these guys, the happier I am. One of the reasons I love these sharks so much is they're actually warm body. Unlike other fish, white sharks keep their blood at 5 to 15 degrees warmer than the surrounding water. Warm blood gives them speed, agility, stamina, but that's not all. As well as more muscle power, warm blood gives them more brain power. These guys are pretty smart, so you really have to watch out for them. These guys make their decisions on whether to strike based on what they see. As she circles the cage, you can see her looking at me all the time, rolling her eye backwards and forwards. White sharks don't have eyelids. Instead, when they strike, they roll their eyes back in the sockets to protect them from harm. The more I learn about these sharks, the closer I want to get. But getting in the water without a cage when great whites are around is taking a big risk. One of my closest calls ever came when I was testing an electronic anti-shark device. The encounter had a happy ending, but I couldn't stop thinking about those jaws and what they could do to me. But things don't always go so well. I've spent a lot of years working with some of the ocean's biggest and most fearsome sharks. And every time I spend time with them, I'm humbled. But it's often the smaller, lesser known species that can create the closest calls. I'm on Australia's Great Barrier Reef, and I'm not alone. This is a white-tipped reef shark. There are pretty common species found around here, and I've been asked to be involved in a research project with these guys. <laughs> and as usual, I've got the tricky part of the job. Hang on, mate. Whoa, careful. How close was that? Sharks like these are incredibly flexible, and that little encounter nearly cost me a trip to the hospital. Yep. Even the little guys can get you into a heap of trouble. What we've done is we've attracted the sharks with some bait so we can get nice and close to them. What we have to do is measure and tag some of these white tips that are hanging around here. To do that, we have to catch them and restrain them. And that's where my job comes in. And it's not going to be easy. Get out of the way. So here goes. We're not just doing this for fun. Catching these reef sharks is the only way to insert high-tech tracking tags for the research program. Sounds easy, eh? Even looks reasonably easy. Wrangling sharks is always a risky business. You never know when a shark will take you by surprise. Because most of these sharks can be handled without too many problems, it's easy to forget that the odd one can be particularly feisty. bitten, 
But the key's not to panic. That could encourage the circling whalers into full-on attack. Oh, that shark. He's so hey, close to Chuck, getting man. it. <laughs> See what I did to my wetsuit? He got bit. And yeah. that is as close as you ever want to get. But sometimes it's not the sharks that present the greatest danger. In the southern Philippines, we wanted to be the first to study and film pelagic thresher sharks. But to do it required some extreme diving, including breathing nitrox instead of air, using rebreathers for complete silence, staying deep for dangerously long periods of time, and having to deal with one of the most stunning underwater experiences I've ever been subject to. Local fishermen hunt in these waters using dynamite, and they aren't too bothered by who else is nearby. Wow, I felt that. When a blast goes off, the shockwave goes right through you. Wow. The blast was almost enough to knock me unconscious. My head feels like a hard drive in my computer has crashed. It's like I have to reboot my brain. And that blast was half a mile away. Any closer and we'd all have been dead. Luckily I wasn't here when the bomb that did this was dropped. The whole top of this big lump of rock here has been completely blasted off. This is one of the results of dynamite fishing. Dynamite comes down, pow! It's just blown on the top right off this rock and killed everything all around it. Dead fish would have floated up to the surface and been collected. It's such a destructive form of fishing. This is a result of that last dynamite blast. Already the percussion has started to damage the marine life. All these beautiful soft corals are normally extended right out but now are starting to droop. That blast has such an impact. It's going to kill these guys. They're all going to die. Diving with these sharks is one of the toughest assignments I've ever had to endure. But it's worth facing the dynamite. Observing the pelagic thresher at close range is a rare privilege. Around here, it isn't the sharks that are dangerous. I wonder what effect this explosive local method of fishing has on them, and on what's left of the other marine life at this ocean oasis. Now, from pelagic threshers to another open ocean species, the mako. This time there's no question, this is a very dangerous shark. Very dangerous indeed. We're at the Poor Knights Islands, about 12 miles off the northeast coast of New Zealand, and I'm here to find the fastest shark in the ocean. Makos can grow to over 14 feet in length and over 1,800 pounds. They have a reputation for attacking boats and cameramen brave enough or stupid enough to get in the water with them. But I want to test a theory, and that is that they're also pretty intelligent. I've got this lovely tuna here. And what I want to do is try and hand feed it to one of these Mako sharks. Now I reckon that these guys are going to be able to tell where my hand stops and where the fish starts. Very intelligent animals, they know what a fish looks like, but I don't think they've ever seen a human, so it should be interesting. So let's try it. I wouldn't suggest other people try this. I've been doing this for a while, and I know what I'm doing, I think. My experience tells me that makos do favour fish over divers and can tell the difference. But this little guy seems to prefer neither. He also needs a lesson in oral hygiene. Those bite marks explain why he's so cautious. They probably came from a bigger mako, and for that reason I need to keep my wits about me. A bigger shark would make short work of me out here in open ocean. But this has to be a smart shark. He's already learned what's good for him and what's not. Looks like he's figured out that I'm not a threat. His acceptance of me is 
quite remarkable. He even lets me examine his wounds. What other predator in the wild would let you do that? But just when we're having fun, my little mates got nervous, and so have I. When the little blokes scatter, it's a sure sign that something bigger is on its way, and the odds are that it's bigger than me too. It's time to get out. Smaller sharks often take off when larger animals show up, and this time's no exception. Makos tend to be loners, and they don't appreciate competition for food. And this one's looking for dinner. And there's some sharks you just don't hop in the water with first off. This is a beautiful female mako shark. She's probably about eight feet long. She's been around the boat now for about the last half hour, just chewing and biting at everything. She's just a, such a beautiful animal. But just that little bit too aggressive, a little bit too big to go jumping straight in with. I still can't resist hand feeding her though. Here we go. Makos are warm-bodied sharks too. That means that they have more muscle power, bigger brains, and are capable of some pretty nasty moods. Make no mistake, a shark this size would easily take my hand off. I'm certainly glad I heeded the warning signs and got out. But sometimes, as much as you want to stay out of the water, things don't go quite according to plan. Tiger sharks are second on the list of most dangerous sharks, right behind the great white. So when you're working with them, you have to be extremely careful. But the best laid plans couldn't prepare me for what was going to happen next. I'm up against a shark that's fighting for its freedom, and his is determined to win as I am. Luckily for me, this shark's more interested in escape than getting even. The interesting thing is that we're catching these sharks just a mile off one of the world's most popular swimming beaches, Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. I'm here with Dr. Kim Holland, one of America's leading shark researchers, to help with a tagging program. We're actually implanting high-tech tracking tags into the sharks. It's surgery at sea, and the anaesthetic doesn't involve a traditional tranquilizer. OK, well, Kim, we can get the shark to calm down by putting it upside down like this. Right. This is a tonic immobility, isn't it? That's right. It's just one of these really strange quirks of nature that if you can get these animals upside down like this, they'll really just pass out. And we don't know why it is, but it makes life a lot easier for us Yeah. and, right. and for the shark. Okay, so here goes the chat tag into the shark. So that's just going into the abdominal cavity. Yeah, lots of room in there. We're going to saw him up and send him on his way. But not before I get into the water with him again. <laughs> and this time it's on purpose. Okay, okay tail rope off. Yeah, I got him. I got him. Okay. 
swimming away. That's a first. I'm not just doing this for a thrill. Most sharks have to swim to pass water over their gills in order to breathe. So until my mate starts swimming, I'm here to give support. If not, he could sink to the bottom and possibly die. OK. And we're on the way down to release our tiger shark. OK, mate. Come on. See you later. That is a six-footer, but what about a 12-footer? Shark off the port bow, about 200 metres, Ed. All right, let's go. Let's go. Looks like we might be on, mate. Look at this guy. <laughs> Isn't he gorgeous? Oh, aren't you lovely? Lovely to look at, but tigers this size have a nasty reputation for attacking humans. During the 90s, there were 33 attacks attributed to tigers in Hawaii alone, two of them fatal. Getting into the water with this monster is a very dangerous thing to do indeed. But now he's preoccupied with chasing this waterlogged albatross chick. I think I'm safe. It's amazing how cool, calm and collected you can appear on the outside when your stomach's tying itself in knots on the inside. But keeping calm is the key to surviving an encounter like this. Relax and show absolutely no fear, even when you know what the animal is capable of. When a tiger shark decides to eat something, nothing will stop it. Even a turtle's big hard shell is no protection against the tiger's wide jaw and scissor action teeth. Each tooth is serrated and curves out from the centre of the jaw. All the shark has to do is shake its head to saw through muscle, bone and shell. If a tooth is lost, several others wait in line to take its place to restore the tiger's deadly bite. And remember, compared with a tough armoured shell of a turtle, I'm like a marshmallow. Getting into the water with feeding sharks is an extremely risky business, even in shallow water. And I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. But this guy over here is concentrating on one thing and one thing only. And that's eating that bird, so I reckon I'll probably be all right. Trust me, I know what I'm doing, I think. The tiger gets its name from the stripes on its back. The ancient Hawaiians regard these sharks as amakua, ancestors transformed into gods or protective spirits. But protective is the last thing they seem up close. In fact, the shark this size must always be considered a threat. Luckily, I was right. He's completely preoccupied with hunting birds. And tigers aren't the only sharks that will eat any opportunity that comes along. Tigers may have a fierce reputation, but oceanic white tips are without a doubt the shark that scares me the most. And for good reason. They've been blamed for hundreds of deaths of sailors and downed aviators, especially during World War II. When you're out of sight of land, these sharks are your worst nightmare. I've always wanted to dive with them, but it's a risky job that my crew and I are not going to take lightly. If that sausage goes off or that clenched fist goes up, two people out of the water as fast as possible. I don't think there's any need for a, a safety diver to be it up with scuba, but I think as long as there's a pair of fins and a mask mm. candy that we can just race out and have assistance if needed. But remember that as soon as you introduce another person to the water, yeah. you, you're potentially going to compound yeah. Yeah. the danger. Yeah. With these guys, it's an absolute liability. 
and, and you have to be aware of that. You know, if you you can't go jumping in like other sharks with these guys. If these guys are fully rocked up, you know, it's it's a serious problem. And if you go introducing another diver, he's not a safety diver. He's a he's a he's a, he's a lamb to the slaughter. <laughs> With words of wisdom like that, sometimes I begin to question my own sanity. I'm off Kona in Hawaii to test the latest in shark technology. I want to see if electronic shark deterrents work on this species. And what a shark to test it on. This oceanic white tip is about eight feet long, big enough to make a mess of me in a few seconds. And you can bet it's already crossed his mind I don't mind telling you, that was a rush. The jolt hasn't exactly sent him packing. He's still interested. All I can do is watch carefully for his next approach. These sharks are named for the white tips on their fins. From a distance, the white flashes look like tiny schools of fish, and they may help to attract some of the sharks' prey. They call this aggressive mimicry, and I can't think of a better name for it. This is one of the few sharks known to attack suddenly without reason. And even more worrying, they're rarely seen alone. <laughs> oh, that's a great animal. That has got to be one of the meanest looking sharks up close. <laughs> they make me so nervous. They are, without a doubt, the top order predator in the ocean, especially, that's only one. Yeah. Imagine when you've got two or three around. I even had to give him a little bit of a zap with the electric on the pole once, and all that does is create a very small electrical field that doesn't electrocute the shark. It jams some of the sensory organs around the nose, and um, he noticed it straight off, which is a good indication that these guys are sensitive to this sort of cod type technology. So uh, that's a really good thing. What a buzz! But there's more to come. The secret to finding oceanic white tips is finding pilot whales. The sharks and the whales almost always seem to travel together. Pilot whales are actually a large species of dolphin. Now, most people think that if there are dolphins about, you're safe from sharks, but that's not true at all. In fact, the opposite is more often the reality. In this case, they both hunt squid. But while the sharks rely on their senses of vision and smell, whales also use echolocation. It's likely that the sharks shadow the whales to take advantage of a whale's echolocation sense. But unlike the pilot whales, the oceanic white tips are extremely opportunistic in their feeding. That means I'll eat pretty much anything, including me. And they have absolutely no fear. Once they see you, they'll turn and they'll just keep coming and coming until they're just inches away. You want to slowly move us up in front, Pat? Oh, yeah, straight towards us. Quick, Mike. We've tried this prototype pod, and I gave the shark a little bit of a shot with it, and it seemed to work quite well. So now what we're going to do is we're going to hop in with the production unit and see how that goes. I'm right behind you, mate. OK. Let's hope this works. These guys are a real worry sometimes, I'll tell you. There's just one little problem. I can't use my scuba gear. You risk decompression sickness if you fly within 24 hours after using scuba and our plane's leaving tonight. That means I have to test the pod while snorkeling. The burly has excited him, and we know that the pod doesn't always stop sharks once they're in feeding mode. But the big unknown is whether any other sharks will show up. If that happens, the danger will instantly escalate, and the chances are we'll be in big trouble.
That was almost too close. I was a little bit late switching the pot on that time. He's definitely interested, but now hopefully there's a line around me he just won't cross. Because it generates an electrical field, the pot isn't recommended for anyone with cardiac problems. Of course, if you're prone to heart attacks, shark diving probably isn't the ideal hobby for you anyway. But as far as we can tell, it doesn't hurt the shark. It just overwhelms his electrical sensors. It's probably something like you or I getting a blast from a car horn. The pot only works on sharks and rays. Fish without electrical sensors should feel nothing at all. And it's certainly not enough to scare this guy off. I'm glad to see it working on this species. I really had my doubts. Touching this amazing shark was one of the biggest buzzes of my life. I certainly wouldn't suggest that anyone else try this. And I'm not going to push my luck. It's time to call it quits. The electronic shark deterrent certainly works. If I wasn't wearing it, I'm fairly confident I wouldn't have made it back to the boat. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Well done. Yeah, mate. It's no question that uh, the old pod works. The pod unit seems to work quite well on these guys, which is good news. That's really great stuff. Uh, if it works on these guys, I can see a lot more high-risk divers like me using the pod in their work. But the most exciting application for this technology could be helping those who don't plan on being in the water. Fitting shark pods in life jackets. Ah, oh, I just love diving with these sharks so much. They're so much fun. It's about as good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're evil. <laughs> they're evil. They're evil sharks, these guys, I'll tell you. The oceanic <laughs> white tip has to be one of the most fearless sharks I've ever dived with. But at least in the clear waters of Hawaii, I could see them coming. Diving in freezing cold water with less than four foot visibility on the edge of a 6,000 foot canyon seems scary enough. But add to that the possibility of great white sharks in the area and the huge and dangerous six gill, along with the 2,000 pound monsters that I'm looking for, and wow. We're out on the edge of the Monterey Canyon off the Californian coast. And I'm here to see a very rare fish, the giant prickly shark. For a few days each year, they come to one spot, and to find out why, we have to catch and tag them. Easier said than done when they can weigh more than a car. Uh, he pulling. Check up that shark, but you know these are. Oh, mate, this is one heavy shark, I tell you. He, he's not light. Researching these sharks on the surface is hard enough, but I also want to get down and try to find them in their own territory. But that's generally so deep it's out of range of any diver. Except for here and now. For a couple of hours each morning, they come up from the depths onto the edge of Monterey Canyon. And that's within diving range, just. 95, 99, 101. I've got to tell you, I'm more than a little nervous about this dive. But the chance to meet a prickly shark in the wild is just too much to resist. Right beneath me is a canyon that drops away six and a half thousand feet to the seafloor. But the limit for ordinary diving is just 130 feet. Everything below that's a mystery. Ah. <sighs> 
Here we are at our depth limit, and I can't even see my own fins. I've got a feeling there are pricklies very close to me, but the problem's going to be to find them in this murk. I'm running out of time. If I stay down much longer, my blood will absorb a critical amount of nitrogen gas from the air I'm breathing. As the pressure decreases on my way up, that gas will form bubbles in my blood. That's the bends. It's not only extremely painful, it can also be lethal. And that's not in my contract. We know very little about these sharks. They've only been seen eating small fish, but she has a huge mouth that's more than capable of inflicting a deadly bite. And they also swim with the dangerous six gill sharks. This shark is about 12 feet long and probably weighs around 2,000 pounds. Pays off. 
And even in terrible conditions like this, one or two foot visibility, if you keep working, you'll eventually succeed. Fantastic animals. And uh, all you see is that big eye. First thing you see is the big eye or the back of the tail. As far as I know, this kind of footage is a world first. Diving with these huge animals is one of the highlights of my life and a real journey into the dark. I still can't get over the feeling of meeting pricklies in their own environment. It'll take days for the adrenaline to wear off. After a couple of decades of doing this sort of stuff, there's one thing that I know for sure. Even in crystal clear water, never ever turn your back on a shark. It's the one you don't see that'll get you. And there's nowhere that's better to prove that than here in the Bahamas. This is Walker's Cay Shark Rodeo, one of the best shark dives in the world. There are maybe 60 to 80 Caribbean and black tip reef sharks circling and feeding. Wow, how close was that? That Caribbean reef targeted me from right up at the top of this pack of feeding sharks. That's the trouble when there's a lot of sharks around. But generally, these guys won't bite unless you harass them. Check this out. Part of a chum has broken away and has been carried around by the feeding sharks. Cameraman Mike is right in the middle. You'd think there'd be trouble. But he remains calm, and even when mouthed, he doesn't react. Keep the camera going, Mike. Keep that camera going. It may look like a frenzy, but the sharks are only biting the food. As long as you don't panic and remain calm, you can even walk away from situations like this. If you see a shark and turn and run, the shark will either sense your fear and give chase, or maybe he'll think that you've got food and also give chase. So rule number one. Never run from a shark. Back away in a slow and controlled manner, but always keep your eyes on the animal. That's a good theory with sharks like these six to eight foot Caribbean and black tips. But what about public enemy number three, the bull shark? While it's third on the list of the most dangerous sharks, when it comes to fatalities, the bull kills more of its human victims than any other shark. There are lots of people who believe that most shark attacks are a case of mistaken identity, but my friend Dr. Eric Ritter doesn't. He thinks that sharks are far too intelligent to make silly mistakes like that. And he's brought me here to the Bahamas to help prove it. We're going to wade out to our waists and place fish heads, food scraps and blood in the water around our legs. Eric says the sharks will be able to tell the difference between our legs and feet and the food. It's a test for the sharks and a big test of our nerve. Eric's also keen to reinforce what we've learned before. Staying calm has a lot to do with being safe. So tell me, why have you got a heart rate monitor on me? And I notice you've got one as well. Yeah, you see, heart rate is a good indicator if you get nervous, if you're yeah. relaxed. You know, and it's, it's much, much easier to work with these big sharks, you know, to see where your heart is or your stage of nervousness. Is anything that's going to raise someone's <laughs> heart rate like a... Like oh, a yeah. nine foot oh, bull shark oh, yeah, mate, in knee deep water. Look, look, look at this guy, I mean, yeah, oh yeah. Just to make things worse, I can't help trying a hand feed. Please don't ever attempt to do this. It's extremely dangerous, but it helps to illustrate the point that Eric's trying to make. Sharks have a far greater ability to discriminate than we've ever given them credit for. But the real test is still to come. I took my hand out of the way before the bite. What if we don't move while the sharks take food from on and around our feet? And the question I've got to ask you, Eric, is how can we do this? Well, you know, you don't have to be afraid of these animals. They're not dangerous as long as you follow certain, certain rules. Certain rules. Yeah. You've got to play the game. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what we can see here, you know? We're here, the sharks are there, you know, they're very hesitant, so our job now is to stay calm, quiet, you know, yeah. and don't give them any ideas that we may be a potential threat. Yeah. Look at the size of that thing. Eighty-three. 
67. You get three bulls out, you know. That was superb. Oh, 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 oh. Superb. <laughs> oh my god. Wasn't that great? There's your heart right now. <laughs> 74. Oh. Well, I got knocked over. Wow. I got knocked over. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> Now, this is what I call amazing. We've got five or six, three metre, nine, ten foot long bull sharks right behind us. They've actually hit Eric and I in our legs and moved us backwards, our entire body weight. What do you reckon about that? I don't know. <laughs> That's great. There's no question that the sharks know exactly what they're doing, but we aren't finished yet. Now it's time to go swimming with them. Eric wants to illustrate how rising heart rates and running away can dramatically change the shark's attitude to us. This could explain why sharks often chase snorkelers and people who panic. Unfortunately, in many of the shark attacks that happen, we fail to see the shark, and without knowing it, we do something to incite the attack. Of course, there are some sharks that are just plain hungry enough to attack us for a meal. But Eric believes true attacks like this are a lot rarer than we think, and his research is proving it. This experiment is about as dangerous as I'm prepared to attempt. As we hold our breath, our pulse rates begin to go up. You can see the circling sharks coming in closer, but not a lot. Just heart rates rising doesn't seem to really bring them in. Now we try that again. This time there are eight sharks all around us and our pulse rates are both up over 100 from the last dive. This, combined with a swimming backwards and forwards, seems to have them more interested. They're all over us, but as long as we remain cool, they don't attack. I can't believe it. I'm still alive, and I had Eric's understanding of these sharks to thank for it. They clearly need another stimulus to bite us. We can add this stimulus just by changing our behaviour. Look what happens when we swim off a little faster. They're right behind us. They're just waiting for a sign that we're either injured or a threat. If we panic now and thrash and splash our way back to the beach, anything could happen. Oh, my God. Did you see that? Oh, I was solid. <laughs> this thing was on my head, you know. As I'm coming deep close to Joe and then I not get a good head scratch. Amazing. Well, kiddies, don't do that at home, OK? <laughs> and that's good advice. While we're starting to see the patterns of their behaviour, sharks are anything but predictable. And perhaps that's why I just can't get enough of them. Well, that's about all the adrenaline I can deliver this time. How can you top that, you're wondering? Well, there's about 450 different species of sharks, and I've only dived with about five dozen of them. I'll keep you posted. So many sharks, so little time. <laughs> <laughs>